Fractals such as the Koch Snowflake and Sierpinski Sieve are self-similar, which means that they are made up of successively smaller copies of themselves. In nature, most fractals aren't exactly self-similar, however, they're statistically self-similar, and so we can still work out their fractal dimension by applying the box method as before. When this is done, the fractal dimension of the coastline of Great Britain turns out to be about 1.25, remarkably similar to that of the Coke Snowflake. South Africa, by comparison, has a much smoother coastline and a correspondingly lower fractal dimension of 1.05. Norway, with the impressive number of deep and convoluted fjords, scores a fractal dimension of 1.52. The concept can be applied to other natural fractals, one notable example being the human lung. Because the lung itself is obviously three-dimensional, you might expect its surface to be two-dimensional. However, the lung has evolved to have an enormous surface area, between 80 and 100 square meters, or roughly half the area of a tennis court, in order to be able to exchange gases as quickly as possible. So convoluted is the lung's surface, with all its countless folds and tiny air sacs or alveoli, that it almost fills the space it contains. Its box dimension works out to be about 2.97, so that measured in this way, it's almost three-dimensional. In the real world, there are only three spatial dimensions, but time is also sometimes considered to be the fourth dimension. It's no surprise then that fractals can exist in time as well as in space. An economic example is the stock market. Over time, there may be large upward and downward fluctuations in the value of stocks, some of which takes place over a period of years and others, such as crashes, that can happen very quickly. As well as this, there are smaller fluctuations when stocks rise and fall seemingly independently of the large-scale trends, and also tinier fluctuations that happen many times a day as individual stocks rise and fall by slight amounts. With the computerization of the stock market, these trends can be followed down to very small slices of time from minute to minute, and even from one second to the next. Another example of a time-based fractal is something we came across in part one, the changing length of the coastline of an island such as Great Britain. At any given moment, the coastline is a purely spatial fractal, the measured length of which depends on the magnification factor. But over time, as mentioned earlier, there are additional variations because of continual erosion and deposition, the coming and going of tides and even of individual waves, and the almost imperceptible rise or fall of whole land masses due to tectonic activity. Of all fractals known to mathematicians, one stands out because of its incredible intricacy. Not only does this fantastic shape have structure at all scales, but at different points at different scales it can look like two completely different fractals. It's the famous Mandelbro set, which was described by the American author James Gleick in his book Chaos, perhaps questionably, as the most complex object in mathematics. Although it carries Benoit Mandelbrot's name, there has been some dispute over who actually discovered it. Two mathematicians have argued that they'd found it independently at about the same time, while another, John Hubbard of Cornell University, has pointed out that in early 1979, he went to IBM and showed Mandelbrot how to program a computer to plot out points of what, after Mandelbrot's publication of a paper on the object the following year, became known as the Mandelbrot set. The feeling is that Mandelbrot was a good popularizer of the field of fractals and devised clever ways to display fractal images, but that he was less than generous in giving credit to other mathematicians where credit was due. 
fabulously labyrinthine though the Mandelbro set is, it arises from a very simple rule, which is just applied over and over again. In essence, the rule is this. Take a number, square it, and add it to a fixed number, then feed the result back into the formula and keep going round and round, or iterating, in this way. The numbers in question are complex numbers. Complex meaning that each is made up of a real number part and an imaginary one, a number times the square root of minus 1. To elaborate on this a little, say we start with a complex number z and a constant c, which is also a complex number. Having chosen a value for z, we apply to it the rule multiply z by itself and add c, or z squared plus c. This gives us a new value for z, which we then feed back into the same rule to obtain the next z value. Some values of z will stay the same and others will repeat in a cycle before eventually returning to their original value. Any of these values that either stays the same or repeats in a cycle is said to be stable if we can change z very slightly and have the new value follow a path that stays very close to the original path. This is like the situation of a ball in a valley. If the ball is moved slightly, it will just roll back to its original position, and is therefore stable. A ball on the peak of a mountain, on the other hand, even if nudged slightly, will roll down the mountain and follow a completely different path, so that this position at the mountain peak is unstable. The stable points are known as attractors. There are also other points which don't necessarily have to be very close to an attractor, which, if we iterate the process indefinitely, tend to the limit of one of these attractors, getting as close to it as we want. These form the basin of attraction for C. Other points may get farther and farther away, diverging to infinity. The boundary of the basin of attraction is known as the Julia set for C. Julia sets are named after the French mathematician Gaston Julia, who, along with his compatriot Pierre Fatou, did pioneering work on the subject of complex dynamics in the early 1900s. If you iterate any point on the Julia set, the resulting point will stay on the Julia set, but may move around it without settling into a repeating pattern. To take an example, when c equals 0, the only attractor is 0. The basin of attraction is the inside of the unit circle, a circle of radius 1, because every point within it will gravitate towards 0 after enough iterations. Outside the circle, the points diverge to infinity. The Julia set is therefore the boundary of the unit circle. This isn't terribly interesting and certainly isn't a fractal. However, apart from c equals zero, the Julia set does indeed form a fractal, and one that may come in many different shapes. Sometimes the Julia set is connected, and sometimes it isn't. When it isn't, it takes the form of Fatu dust which, as the name suggests, is a cloud of disconnected points. Fatu dust is actually a fractal with dimension less than 1. The Mandelbro set is the set of all values of C for which the Julia set is connected. It's one of the most recognisable, yet counterintuitive fractals. Although the Mandelbro set is connected, there are tiny specks that don't seem to be joined to it at all, but in fact are, by means of extremely slender filaments. When magnified, these specks are found to be replicas of the entire Mandelbrot set, which may seem surprising at first, but actually fits in with our understanding of the nature of fractals. These offshoots are imperfect replicas, however, no two of which are exactly alike, and for a very good reason that turns out to be one of the most profound facts about the Mandelbro set. If you zoom in on any point on the boundary of the Mandelbro set, it begins to look more and more similar to the Julia set at that point. The Mandelbro set, a single fractal, contains infinitely many completely different fractals in the form of a vast array of Julia sets, 
all along its boundary. Indeed, the Mandelbro set has been called a catalogue of Julia sets. Its boundary is so extraordinarily complex that it turns out to be two-dimensional, though with zero area.